Hello, my name is Daniel Tyler. The Dickens novel I am teaching for the 19th century summer school is Bleak House. One doesn't have to look far in that novel to find an interesting quotation, because the opening words are famously arresting. The novel begins, London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus, 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. One common way of thinking about Victorian fiction is in terms of realism, the dominant mode of fiction in the period. It's often thought that realist novels efface their own language and techniques as they seek to represent an imagined reality that lies beyond the page without the form of the representation itself getting in the way. Immediately in Bleak House, these expectations, if we have them, are overturned. This is true in all of Dickens, really, but Bleak House in particular strikes us from the outset as an unforgettable encounter with the vitality of Dickens's language and style. So those first words, London, Michaelmas term lately over and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall, implacable November weather, confront us with an innovative use of language. They draw attention to the writing on the page, and indeed this is a novel that is preoccupied with language, with writing, with documents and paperwork. The connection between all the legal papers that fill the novel's pages and the novel itself as a mass of paper is a connection that runs throughout the novel in imaginatively suggestive ways. Equally, that first word London suggests a world of possibility to Dickens' imagination. Almost all of his novels are set in London, or at least moved there in order for the action to get going. And this is a novel in which Dickens' intimate knowledge of the city, including its slums and byways, its poverty and its ill health, provides more than a backdrop for the action. It has itself the prominence of a major character. The absence of main verbs in those first sentences is also significant because it establishes from the outset an atmosphere of stagnation. In the novel, the Jarndyce and Jarndyce case in which the main characters are caught up is interminable, and the aristocratic deadlocks are themselves lethargic and apparently weary, and so it's appropriate that even these opening sentences lack the purposive forward movement that main verbs would give them. And then we have that remarkable image of a megalosaurus waddling up Hoborn Hill, which of course it both would not and would be wonderful to see. Dickens begins here that combination of the fantastic and the ordinary, the familiar and the strange, that is the hallmark of this novel. He famously wrote of his, of his intention to consider the romantic side of familiar things, and many aspects of London and ordinary life are transformed by Dickens's brilliant reimagining of them. But there are so many unusual events and characters here, not to mention an episode of spontaneous combustion, that it is as if Dickens equally presents us with the familiar side of romantic things. Lastly, a word about the idea reiterated throughout the novel that the waters of Noah's flood have but recently withdrawn. This collapsing of the elongated timescales of human history so that the present scene seems like a primordial moment seems to me crucial in establishing the emblematic quality of the novel, its ability to transcend its Victorian setting. The novel then becomes representative of some enduring condition. Its diagnosis of human and social ills is not tied to the specific concerns of mid-19th century London. It has a wider view than that, which is why it is such a memorable and enduring novel.